Welcome and thank you for joining us for one of our Women's History Month programs. We're honored to have Susan Webster with us tonight. Susan's here to talk about two of her feminist projects, um, the Wait What series of drawings, that's an exhibition that's hanging in the front gallery, and her Rowware project, which she'll speak more about in a bit. Before I tell you a bit about Susan, a few words about our format tonight. For those, wanting to, for those watching online, you can ask questions by typing them in the chat section of the video feed, and we'll read them here in the gallery at the end in the Q&A portion of the program. For those who want to strut their stuff in their own row wear, you can drop off your article of clothing here in the gallery, either tonight or later. This will be an ongoing rollout. Susan will pick up the, the articles of clothing. She'll apply her Defend Your Own messaging. And this she's covered in as well. And then drop them off in the gallery for pick up at your convenience. There's a $40 charge, 40% donated to Planned Parenthood in the name of the wearer. Susan is a native Mena who has lived on Deer Isle for over 30 years. Her work has been shown throughout Maine and beyond, including the Center for Maine Contemporary Art, the Institute for Contemporary Art at Mecca, the, Institute, the, Jew, the Maine Jewish Museum, and of course, both here and at Green Hut Galleries in Old Port. Susan is also an educator with extensive teaching experience. She's taught at Haystack, the University of Maine, Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina, the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Connecticut, the Manhattan Graphic Center, and the Studio Artwork Center in Jerusalem, just to name a few. And she received the Bill Banyan Artist Educator Award from the Maine Alliance for Arts Education. Susan's combining her art practice with political activism started early in her career, when after college she was awarded a federal grant to develop an art program as an artist in residence at the Maine Correctional Center. During those years, she witnessed how many of her students were often marginalized and underserved by the correctional and judicial systems. That experience had a lasting effect on her artwork and her political activism. The intersection between art and politics is on full display in her Wait What series and her Rowware project. So without further ado, I turn things over to Susan. We can learn about both. Thank you. <laughs> So great. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And welcome, friends. Friends on Facebook and everybody here. Wherever you are, welcome. And I appreciate you sharing this moment together. A uh, huge thank you to Callie and John for inviting me to show the wait, what? drawings. <laughs> and the Rowware Project for promoting that. Um, a special thanks, Kelly, to all the brainstorming sessions that we did together, and I really appreciate your advice and your grace and your activism. Uh, also, thanks to Diamond and Roy for the um, beautiful sense of detail in hanging the drawings and the Rowware display. Um, and I appreciate having this opportunity to talk to you about both bodies of work. Um, so before Roe Ro and Wade, which was in 1973, when I was a teenager in high school, I knew someone who needed help, but they couldn't find the help. She lived in a nearby community, and at that point, there was no place to go to get a legal dignified, safe abortion. So she resorted to an underground abortion network where she obtained um, secretly an, an illegal abortion. And as it turned out, it failed. So she was forced to carry the pregnancy to term. So that experience has stayed with me and it upended and up, it just turned me upside down that somebody could lose that freedom and, and not have the right to make that decision and the direction of the path of your life. So um, you may know this, that Roe versus Wade 
was a 1973 landmark decision of the Supreme Court uh, that ruled that the United States, the Constitution of the United States, would provide safety and give people the liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government um, restrictions. Imagine. And also, that, that that decision said that the individual's privacy um, also extended to the uterus. And I, I like to think like inside the uterus, too. <laughs> and those aren't exactly the words. I'm saying pregnant people. I'm saying a slightly different way of characterizing it. But, but basically, we can see how things can be reinterpreted and what, 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 what is at stake. So, um, in 2016, you may remember that Donald Trump's presidential campaign, he promised that he would find and appoint anti-abortion judges to the Supreme Court. The other thing that he promised is that he would end all the federal funding for, the, for Planned Parenthood. So just a year after Trump's into his presidency in 2018, I think we all began to see how his presidency had begun reshaping abortion. And, and there were more laws that were being introduced in bans and restrictions. So that was around the time when I decided that I needed to put Defend Row on my clothes and the clothes of my friends and family. Um, and that's how, how it, it started. I wanted to wear it and generate some kind of awareness and some kind of discussion about what is at stake. We could be losing um, abortion access. So I designed and cut out a stencil, and I went to my studio, and I had a particular size of screen, and so that determined the, the size, and just this, and had, uh, you know, alphabet stencils that I went and got to the hardware store, as I kind of wanted that, like it looked like maybe I had just spray painted it on the wall, like the guerrilla art, street art look, a little bit to it. I really wanted it to be not a personalized, in a sense, look to it. Like, it just could happen anywhere. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, start, I started doing that. And my friend and neighbor, Liz, listener who's in this, sitting over there, um, I would say perhaps she might have more clothing with Defend Row on it. <laughs> but I, I just want to say something about her because... I did a lot of talking with Liz at that time. And 2018, it seemed, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to do this. This is important, but, you know, maybe I won't have to keep doing it. But the other thing is that I credit Liz for coming up with the name Roe, where. And that was just, that was great. Thanks. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is a collaborative. Uh, well, I call it a, a, a wearable, you know, art project. It's, I can't do it without you. And I can't do it without the public. So the whole idea, the whole art of it for me, also the fact that your body is political, it's like just all kind of just comes together. But the part is that I depend on you and I depend on other people. I'm just like overwhelmed, like thinking, oh, I've got like 15 bags out there and then, you know, I mean, it's great, and, uh, but that's, that you complete the work. And, um, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. Uh, so, Kelly mentioned the fact that, so that the materials come to me, I write Defend Row on it, you give me $40, and then 40% of that goes to Planned Parenthood. And I think that... Um, what seems really great about it is that it, 
is engagement. And it gives people an opportunity to talk to other people. Uh, I'm beginning to collect stories about that. I have um, have a few, and I, I'm going to, maybe that'll be my next talk. But I, it's, they're coming in. I ask people to tell me, maybe a reason why you want to wear it. Or have you had some engagement that, that um, strikes you with other people? Because you have to be prepared to talk about it. Um, so, okay, a little bit more about me and Kelly mentioned a few things and, uh, yeah, so after, after college, um, I moved to Portland and I received this federal jobs grant and that was to develop an art program at the Maine Correctional Center. And that was a big deal for me. Uh, there was nothing there before me and that's another thing I like is Actually, I like control, for one thing. But I, I, I liked it because I could make it, I could make something happen, and I really like that. I really prefer to find out um, how it can go together and what are the resources and what are the materials. It's really kind of how I work in, in my artwork as well. So it was like a great big art project. And it was a big success. Um, they kept me for a long time. First it was a grant, and then they said, no, we're going to get state funding for you. And I said, yeah, but I don't have an education. You know, I'm not certified. And they went, oh, we'll figure that out. So, so I stayed for a, a, a really pretty long time, time, off and on for 10 years, and stopping to have um, children along the way. I'm a mother of two amazing sons. So I got to know the women. Oh, this is the other thing is, so this is where all the women are housed. Um, who have committed a crime. And um, that's where they are. And I got to know them, and they're my students. And women talk and share stories. And they told their stories, and I listened, and I learned a lot. And I began to understand the, the, the extent of that gender inequality that, that, I'm, that I just could see. And of course, there are other groups of people who also are really hurt in this system. So I could see that um, it was statewide, it was nationally, um, and most of all what I heard and saw and got to know were women who committed assault and sometimes murder um, in self-defense. And they had received longer sentences than men. And they had been in these positions of, of survival and horrible situations. And statistically, men uh, premeditate their crimes of murder or assault against their intimate partners, and women generally have no other recourse. Um, men also do use guns in, in Maine, statistically. We have quite an, um, there's a high percentage of hom homicides are usually have to do with domestic violence. So, tragically, too, I have a relative um, who was killed by her partner. Uh, she didn't live in Maine. I didn't know her that well, but at family reunions I knew her. She's a little older than I am. And uh, she was in a terrible relationship, and as she was planning her escape out of that relationship, um, and she delivered her son in the morning to a safe place, um, she was abducted by him. And she disappeared. Uh, could only find her car. Uh, and they never didn't find the man for a long time until, until finally, like years after, he was captured and, and sentenced. So jumping forward to Deer Isle. Yeah, I've been living in Deer Isle for a long time. And the other part, I'm sort of showing you, I don't know, maybe ways it makes sense to me that my art is also action and what I do and think about and engage with people. And after being at the prison, uh, you know, people knew about that on DRL and they said, oh, you know, we've got lots of things that you could do and, and, and up around where we are and work with people and do art and, uh, I decided that that wasn't what I was going to do. 
And the next step, domestic violence project, is the resource center in um, Hancock County and Washington counties, uh, which is um, you know, one of the members of the main coalition to end domestic violence. And I decided that I would do the training and become a hotline volunteer. And I've also been a board member and a member of the education outreach program. So I've been involved with this organization for a long time. And I, I think, I, I just think the training is brilliant. If you don't even want to be a hotline volunteer, the training, uh, whoever did this, I just think everybody should do it. It asks us to think of our prejudices, uh, what are our strengths, our weaknesses. I mean, it, it's just an amazing training that teaches us how to not judge and how to speak to somebody to help that person without telling them what to do, how to maybe make that next step towards something. It could be making, it could be making a cup of tea. So I've, I've had a lot of experience on, on the hotline and it suits me and it doesn't upset me. It, um, it's very intimate. I'm on the phone and sometimes it's at night and sometimes it's hours and sometimes it's short, but it's a connection that um, is just something that I can do that feels, uh, feels like a little notch or something better happening in the world. And the other thing about the next step is, um, and, and I think all of the, the coalitions, they have amazing mission statements. <laughs> and I had this memorized for a while. I'm not sure if I have it, I have it here, but I just, I'm gonna read it. Um, actually, I didn't, it's from my memory, <laughs> but um, so. The next step supports and empowers people who have been affected by domestic violence while striving to prevent and end the cycle of violence through education and social change. Every individual has a right to live in safety without the fear of abuse. We offer hope, love, and respect for ourselves. That's an interesting phrasing, comes that way. Ourselves, for our clients, the people we serve, and our communities to foster empowerment, personal dignity, equality, and freedom. And through these values, we strive to change the world. And then there's um, one other part. Um, that's the next step. And then the main coalition has something that's a little bit longer. But the end of it is they, they talk a lot about um, any forms of oppression, like racism, sexism, ageism, classism, and, and they just say that any force of, any use of force or threat to achieve and maintain power is manifested in all these isms and that all those struggles against oppression are related. And it, it uh, I think for me, starting with domestic violence and we work with some men too, it, it seems like the foundation of so much of family and, and generally women who are not going to have the same kinds of opportunities. It's so connected to me with um, abortion. That's out about the Real Wear Project. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, so, wait, what? <laughs> okay, so there they are, some of them. Um, well, they started actually, um, I started working like this in 2015 um, when my husband, Stuart Kessman, and I were in Japan at um, Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural, Cultural Park. And uh, Stu, you were there. He was there to speak about and represent Haystack. And it was a really big international convention. And this huge kind of 
oval auditorium. And it was like, for me, it was like being at the United Nations because there were so many people, so many languages, so many speakers, and it went on. It seemed like for days, but it probably was three days. But I, that's, and it was sort of remote. This is an amazing place. It was very remote. And I like to travel with small things to draw and do. And what happened, I was doing there, so I would go up and, you, oh yeah, you get your, your headphones and you could choose languages. And I started listening, like something was in English, but I would listen into another, another language. And somebody might be speaking in Japanese and I'm still another, another language, so I'm sort of hearing all of the sound and in this foreign country, which just kind of sweeps you away, right? And I started drawing and these very small drawings and they would, they would take all day, I mean, hours, hours. And I just, it just felt like, I didn't really think about it actually. I don't know what it felt, I just felt good. I just like doing it. And I continued doing it when I came home. And then um, kind of skip into here that we're now in 2016 and a year later and Donald Trump um, is, uh, there are many debates, as we know, with Hillary and, and Donald Trump. So after Donald Trump said that infamous demeaning comment directed to Hillary Clinton during that, maybe the last one, nasty woman, uh, I, I thought, okay, t-shirt time. Uh, and I, I, remember, I remember saying to Stu, actually we were in Portland, Oh my God, we'll never forget that night, right? It's just one of those things. I just can't believe it. So, so anyway, he says this thing, right? And I turned to Stu and I said, if I was home, I'd be making a stencil right now. I can guarantee you there are thousands of women and men going to write, write and do this because if she's a nasty woman, we all have to be. And it's really not about being nasty, although if you want to be, absolutely. <laughs> But what it's about is, is coming together and sharing that kind of violence. So um, I, was, <laughs> I was in home, so I couldn't do that. We were here. Um, but as soon as I got home, I did that. Kind of like you can, I can see now, like this was sort of the beginning of Defend Row. So I just did it and thought, well, at the time, I remember going to yoga class, and everybody in the yoga class wanted one. And we took this picture together. And we're also happy because who would um, vote for this person after he would say such a rude and, um, well, violent, so I can think of, um, remark in public and the way he would stalk her. And speaking of which, going back to um, in domestic violence training, there's a thing called the power and control wheel, and there are all different kinds of ways people coerce and they use emotional abuse and verbal abuse and you know there's a whole line of and I would also say check 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 and he just lined right up as an abuser oof okay so I did that and um, made the t-shirts and he was elected <laughs> as you know and when I would get ready for printing I would take this the stencil and they weren't, it wasn't even adhered. It was just like, okay, let's stick it on. Um, and to get, the, to get it going, to kind of prepare it, I would do it on paper. And I was like, scratch the paper around. I was like, oh, I'll do it on this. And well, let's do it on this. And then I could see where little fragments of the letters just started to really pop up to me. And um, that's when I started realizing that that would make a good body of work. Um, I'm sure I've written something really good about this. Um, yeah, so what I, yes, I did. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm sharing the violent, that violent intent of his words, and it motivated me to transform something horrible into something beautiful. And I cut them up, and that felt really good. I'm cutting the words up. Um, and then going back to this kind of intuitive way of responding to the shapes and whatever, you know, one has 
maybe WOM or part NA. I mean, if you've seen them, you can see some here. Um, it just was um, which is so great. I felt like I was taking that kind of intimidation and then transforming it into courage and positive statements. So the titles of all the pieces also are preceded by a hashtag sign. And I like that because it's a reference to social media and uh, you know, there are really good things about that and people can get a lot of information out. We know how it can be a really good tool. And that was intentional because uh, some of the phrases would have caught on and you may see them in the titles um, and they get very popular and but some were I, like I would hope this one would be you know it sort of make it up depending on on how I felt about the piece when I was done so I'm going to give you just a few examples of that so um, the I don't know if this one is up here but the um, postcard uh, the title for that one is nevertheless she persisted so that one as we know um, was at was in 2017 after the US Senate voted to require Senator Elizabeth Warren to stop talking and that was of course who was that majority leader Mitch McConnell he makes this remark and but the best part is not the best part but she just goes outside and, and read and reads it and she persevered, and, and it was a, a, if I, I'm sure about this, right about this, but it was a reading, um, she was quoting the 1986 letter written by Coretta uh, Scott King, and I have read that, and it was beautiful. So that's one, and then, um, and then I also have dates in front of them, so the next, that was 2 8 17. There's one twenty one seventeen. It's, I, it's worldwide wide self determination. Sometimes, so I can make that up. But that was referring to the women's uh, march the day after Trump's inauguration, and so it became worldwide, it's huge. And then another one, maybe a little not as um, familiar to us, is three eighteen nineteen dash to one twenty two twenty two. I just wanted to write twenty two twenty two, but it's called equal pay, equal pay, equal pay, equal pay. And it refers to the equal pay settlement for the U.S. Um, women's national soccer team, which they worked at for that whole time. And um, it took that many years for that to happen. And then there are titles and words that I just wanted to use, like your story, my story, our story. So I want people to not, I mean, I am making reference to th some of these things, but uh, not, not always. And um, so I, waiting for you and proud of it. Love is love no matter what. <laughs> Things like that. That that is that about um oh boy. About uh wait, what? Oh and wait what? Oh yeah. So so Kelly and I are talking and I was like, you know, I I call them intuitive drawings, which they are. And then we both said, Yeah, but you know, there's an opportunity here for me to say one more thing. I had no idea. And we talked about this. We talked about, oh, you know, you write down all these lists, and you do. And I wrote down all these lists and lists and things. And I thought, oh, it just came to me. It's like, wait, what? Because during the whole time, you know, Trump and our country and abortion restrictions coming, and like there are like 108 of them right now in 19 states that have passed already, by the way, um, that just kept coming. And you're like, okay, well, you know, it can't get any worse than this. And you go, I'm like, wait. What? Did you hear the news today? Or, and we're still doing that. I mean, we are still doing that. And may we pray for peace. I mean, there's just so much going on. Um, but yeah, wait, what? And also, it's something, because we can't just be depressed all the time. So, you know, it's, I, 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 liked, I liked it. I like having, having that. I was very excited about the title. I remember sending it to Kelly, and she goes, perfect. Um, all right, so, you know, I also have special guests tonight. Um, and it's a surprise. And um, let's see, what do I have to say? Okay, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about. So, it's Ber their names are Bertine and Anne, and they're paper dolls. 
And um, they came into being in 2015. And it was a collaboration creation um, of Rebecca Goodale and, and me. And they, they're multidiscipline. They're in these multidiscipline studios. It might look a lot like Haystack, although we don't say that. But it has some you know, familiarity to people who have been there before, maybe. Um, but they can do everything. They have equipment, and they've got everything to do all of the studios, um, outfits, everything. And, um, and if, even if they don't know how to do it, they're just right in there with, you know, blacksmithing and everything. So they're, they're pretty sassy and confident, um, and they're artists in residence, um, and skilled in many, many practices. Well, there are many of them because there are many books that we have between us, Rebecca and I, so we divided them up. We did, that, we did this in 2015. So the two that live at my house, I gotta tell you, they, they became activists um, after Trump's election. And, you know, they attended the Women's March. In fact, there's a whole group came, we went with you folks to the Women's March in Augusta and Bertie and Ann were there, and they had lots and lots of photo opportunities, and they had lots of signs. They wear everything they've got. You know, I'm going to bring them out in a little bit because they're just, they're very distracting. Um, and they, so they went to Augusta, and they also traveled to New York City to protest at the Trump Tower. And they made an appearance at Union Square Station, where all those post-its where everybody was going crazy with the post-its all over that the picture taken there, and they found um, the street in Brooklyn called President Street. And they had the picture taken there. Actually, some people were in their apartments. Um, it was Thanksgiving. And these women looked out and said, what are you doing? And I had them on this long kind of pole. And, and my family was around. We are taking pictures. And they said, can we take a picture with them? And so they had pictures with, with uh, Bertine and Ann. And, and Kelly and John said it was okay that I have a special guest, so I'm going to bring them out a little bit. Um, and um, where else did they do? Well, anyway, they've, they've kind of upped the ante here a little bit and with Defender O because they're really supportive of what I do. And um, they wanted to come here. And I, and I did warn Kelly. I said, you know, I don't know. I'm going to go home and we'll see. But so they did, and they, were, they drove down with us because they can't, they're so small, they can't drive. <laughs> and, um, and you know what they did on the, on the way down, and I said I'd do this too, is they composed a list of aspirational statements, is what they called it. And then they went on to say that they'd like to be referred to as a dream team for change. <laughs> and um, they've written what is, they've said is a Women's History Month manifesto for 2022. So these are the things that they hope it's going to happen. You want to meet them? Yeah. I hope we can get a good shot of them, Reggie. We'll do our best. Okay. If you could come in close. There they are. You can have a closer look when you, you know, when I'm done. But the new ones that they put on, um, they worked last night, and they, it's just kind of like got to do this. So they did one um, stop voter suppression um, and we demand secure elections for all four because um, <laughs> they've got Defend Row hats now with their, you know, the pussy ones. Um, they got everything here. Love is love, Black Lives Matter, it's upside down, uh, climate change, so everything, everything, they're just everything. Love is a terrible thing to hate, it's a bag. Um, yeah, so there's, there's Nasty Woman and Defender O. Okay, so I told them, okay, so they have six things that they wrote down. So I'm going to read it. It's going to be the first time that I've read it too. So. All right, so these are their wishes for next year. No one will feel ashamed for having an abortion or feel alone. In the U.S., one in four people who have wombs will have an abortion in their life. 
And by the way, the majority of people who have abortions are already parents. Check out, they're on, how do they, they're on social media. Check out the sweet feminist on Instagram to watch her abortion, very bad writing, um, affirmations posts, they're great. Okay, number two. Abortion pills, misoprostol, and mifepristone, this is good, will be in every home, along with arnica ointment, <laughs> calendula basalts, eucalyptus bubble bath, comfrey and chamomile leaf tea, a lavender eye pillow, heating pad, Tylenol and ibuprofen, okay? That makes sense. Um, medical abortion currently accounts for 54% of the abortions. That's, that's true, that is so true. And we probably should all be stocking up on these pills in case we all know what's happening there too, because that's been going after that. Oh, oh okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, okay. Three, let me see. Really bad handwriting. Um, we want all the Republican lawmakers who are committing immoral and inhumane acts of harm to innocent citizens by restricting abortion procedures and abortion pills to be run out of their states. <laughs> My God! By multitudes of frogs and dogs swarms of lice and locusts, <laughs> fire and brimstone coming down from the skies, rivers overflowing, tornadoes, volcanoes, and motorcades of big green jeeps. Oh my god. Okay. Um, oh, they have a recommendation that yesterday, March 29th, you may have heard this on NPR, but if you haven't, that morning edition was great. I, I'll have to listen to it. Several states are proposing new restrictions on abortion pills. Okay, great. They have more time than I do sometimes, so listen to the radio. Okay, four. We want abortion to be accessible everywhere and be a part of everyone's health care. Oh my goodness. As much as we like your Rowear project and wearing defend Roe improves any outfit and is a great conversation starter. Sorry, Susan, but it would be great to not be fighting the, this battle. I, I'd have to agree with them on that, too, definitely. Um, five, by next year, everyone will know who Rebecca Gompertz is, and she will win the Nobel Peace Prize. So. I, I, I think maybe I should let you know who she is. She's great. She's a Dutch doctor um, and an artist, and she's a founder of Women on the Ways. And she, brought a, she, was, she, took, she took a ship to um, international waters and brought people out of their country so she could perform abortions, because she's a doctor and an artist, um, and then also um, distributed pills. She's amazing. I agree with them 100%. And um, she also founded uh, Aid Access. And what I really like too is that um, she got funding from the Dutch National Arts Council, if you can imagine that happening here, to pay for all the medical equipment. And she got shipping crates. So she's in, made a little abortion stations in them and put them on the ship. And she also got a, um, a Mondrian Foundation Arts Award, so she, she's, she's remarkable. Um, okay, so she's got something, they have something else here, and it, okay. And in, you can, and we can tell you that if you ask Susan, she'll tell you to watch, this is true, the documentary film Vessel, available on Amazon Prime, <laughs> about, about Rebecca and her amazing courage to help women who need abortions. Number six. Refer back to all the others. What? <laughs> oh, wait, what? <laughs> oh, we do realize you can't always get what you want. Um, 
So, oh, this is good, I think. Let's keep working so everyone has body autonomy and all of humanity works together to build a society and world that is free and equal and loving. <laughs> That's it. next <laughs> questions right does anybody have any or comments as we like people say it's more of a comment than a question yes so I bet you quite a few times and you've always been wearing your own wear yeah I bet so <laughs> tell me what kind of conversations that are starting. oh yeah okay well um, quite a number of them. Um, the two that stand out most is ones that I really love is people who don't know what Roe is. So one was we were in Massachusetts and staying at a hotel and I was wearing a white, I can't remember, like, a white top and side, sideways like this, black. So I did, I, oh, by the way, I used white and black Pretty much, that's it. So when you give me something, cotton works best. Okay, I digress. So um, they, this person was young and, as you know, walking around doing something. And uh, she said, wow, I really like the design. You know, I like that pattern. Because out of sideways, it's, it's different, uh, of course. And I thanked her. I said, yeah, thanks, thanks. And, and so then she starts like, <laughs> and it's fun. I do like the fact that it's broken up. There, there is like a, a little bit of a bigger space between defend and row, but I was limited by, remember the screen? That was the only size screen. I haven't thought about changing it. But anyway, um, she said, oh, what is that? I don't know what that is. So I explained what it was, and she said, oh, yeah, I'm for that. Um, she was a person of color, and she was very excited, and we talked about the news. Um, and then another time, right here in Portland at Dunkin' Donuts, oh wait, it's just Dunkin', right? <laughs> I like Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, I like saying it, alliteration. Um, I was there, and had on something. I don't remember what the, I'm, I, it must have been, it could have been, I have some tops, you know, like jackets. I put it on the back. And the person asked me uh, what that was. And, you know, I know not to look at people and try to figure out anything about what they think. But I was thinking something that this person would be very accepting. And so I said what it was. And she said, oh, I'd, I would never do that. Never. And I said, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's good to know that. And so I waited a while, and she's giving me the coffee. And I said, what would you think if somebody else did? <laughs> and then she said, oh, that'd be fine with me. As long as I don't have to. And I said, well, you know, there are people that it works the other way sometimes. <laughs> You're lucky that you're choosing not to, and it's okay. But uh, yeah, that those two, those two stand out. Oh, and then one time I was visiting uh, Isaac and Josie and the kids, and walking down the street. In fact, I think I came back and told you about. It's it like walking down the street, and it was warm, and these young women went by and said, "Thank you," you know. It's like, "Yay!" And I was like, "Yeah." yeah. I think I was like, you know, I had a baby carriage, <laughs> stroller. Things like that happen. And sometimes people will, you know, want to know about it. And uh, now that, I mean, thanks to this opportunity at Calm Street, I've had more people, you know, people are, people are dropping things off at, in the barn. It's like, who is this? I got to find out, you know, oh, you know, yeah, didn't I, we talked to you about that in my neighborhood even. So uh, 
but um, I, I do pass things out. Because if, if somebody just is out there in the world, they can always send me something. Um, and I have postcards that describe what it is. A lot of people ask me, like, okay, so where can I buy, where can I buy the t-shirt in your bags? <laughs> I was like, no, no. I mean, I talked a little bit about that. It's really, I just love the fact that it's about our bodies. So we're choosing, we're making a choice. And maybe you want to go out and buy something new. That'd be great. Or something favorite, you know. Um, but that's a fun thing. That's a, a really, really fun thing to see what, what people choose. And um, Yeah, so I got one just the other, other day from Massachusetts, and the person did everything right. It was great because I asked for postage paid, um, you know, return package is stuffed in there and and I need to know your address so I can I can make this donation in your your honor and so they actually it's wonderful because Planned Parenthood I've set it up that they can just put your name in and then they they should get a letter to you like in the mail it's great it's great yes I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about the making Yeah. But they're also, they're so practical. I mean, they're really... Well, I do like things that I consider, I mean, I do like that they're pleasing to look at. I think they are. Um, but I will talk a little bit about black, because uh, I grew up, I'm a Mainer. I grew up in Maine, and I remember going down east with my parents, and there were lots of road stops for craft of many people, and groups of people selling things. And some of them were um, paintings on velvet. I loved them. <laughs> I loved them. And then I went to school and found out I don't tell anybody. <laughs> God, it's such, do not do that. And I'm kind of obstinate. Um, I mean, I think that I'm, sometimes I think, I mean, I think I'm nice enough, but I'm, I really know what, what I want, and I don't like it when people tell me you can't do it, and I really, I think there's a side of me, even though I, I really love painting and abstraction, and I do some of that, I, I, and there's a little resistance, like, mm, I'm going to do something that um, is contrary, uh, and I think this represents a little bit of that attitude. Um, I, I'm really curious to paint on velvet now too, but, but because I had the black um, and they were small and I'm, I like to embroider and horrible, horrible at it, just a mess. Um, this was, control, I could control it. And every mark would be like, oh my God, oh, mm -hmm. ah, what? What, wait, what? Um, so there's lots of line. Uh, I can see, you know, looking at these the ones, I, I've done so many of them, and, and Kelly and John, you know, chose, and I'm looking at them, and you, know, you can sort of see the landscape sometimes, and the anchoring of the horizontal, uh, water maybe. Um, I'm a florist daughter, and a lot of other kinds of work I do Things might look like flowers, but if you look at them, you're like, uh-uh, that's not really real. So there's a certain kind of fantasy or some kind of world that I think about somewhere. And I also feel like everything kind of organizes itself. I'm always surprised. Um, and I use, um, you know, metallic inks paint and bulb, the ballpoint, the pens, and I use colored pencils. Yeah. Is that? Answer. Do you ever imagine yourself in those worlds? I do. I do. I really, really do. And they seem huge, right? Like do this fast installation. Like what? Do this fast installation. Yes. <laughs>
Wow. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Well, it was therapeutic to cut those letters up. <laughs> and then after that, they just sort of became tender. Um, came like little gems to me. I mean, really, I hadn't, haven't shown them. And then Kelly sees them on my, I was like, oh, I'm going to put like five of them on terrible my website. I'm going to get better. I always say that. I promise. I'm going to get that better. Um, and Kelly wrote me and said, hey, what about those? And I said, oh my God, do I have them? So I come in with like so many. I just, I have, I'm, I have them with me now. I mean, I carry them around. Um, so, so I think they, they definitely calm me. I mean, they do, they're great to do. They're just great to do. Why not enjoy it? Well, I mean, there's so much else that is not. I, I just, I don't really have any say in it almost. Really, seriously, I just, I don't have any say in it. It's what's happening to me. <gasps> Stu Kestenbaum has a question. Oh, no. no more of a I, more of a he's, a we're, we're married to each other. <laughs> and about a year ago, right, we were here. Oh, I'm. Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a. It really is. I, I was. For, I forgot all about it. So, when you go look at the work, it's smaller <laughs> than this, and I decided that all the mats needed to be like white lace and really clean uh, doilies that I don't own, but I, I, buy, I buy them and sometimes print on them, and I also run them through a press. So I'm, all of the mats are individually composed and embossed. So when you go out and look at them, and, I, and it does, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's something you won't, I don't think you see it right away. And I, I like that, because I don't, I wouldn't want everybody to come up and tell me how great the mats are. <laughs> Even though I really do think they're great, <laughs> they're, they're in context of, they, they, they hold it. It's almost like having your mother hold you, you know, they're, they're, um, they're great. I think thank you. That's a, um, you know, we're running out of, out of time. Um, does, is there anything? Hey, Facebook people, I wonder if there's anything there. We don't probably know, but it's okay. It's okay. I think we're, I think we're done. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'll come out here. Yeah, oh no, you, you two need to just come by because of the way they look. Just right here. Just, just sachet. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, Mary. Come on, Mary. Any, who else has got one on here? Who else? Come on up. Where is my brother? Did he go? Lynn, back to Roy, Kimberly. Okay, so that's my brother up there in the left-hand corner. He was here, and he left, I think. But there he is. Kelly, Roy. Good job. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.